All right. Welcome to the latest episode of Conversations, which is our show where we sit down with actors and others in the film industry. And I'm honored today to sit down with the producer of the upcoming Netflix film, which will be undoubtedly an awards contender. The film is called Passing, directed by Rebecca Hall. Um, but today we have the producer or one of the producers of that film, Nina Yang Bon Jovi. Nina, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Tim. I'm super happy to be here. All right. So, you know, it's funny because every time I'm about to do these, I usually do a little research on the person because, you'll, you, you know, I know the name and I know some of the projects you've worked on, whether it was Sorry to Bother You, Dope, Fruitvale Station, some of the other things that you and your producing partner, Forrest Whitaker, have produced. But I noticed that you have a very unique background of growing up, uh, you know, outside of our country until you were five and you moved here. Now, how has that experience of what you dealt with, with you, within your culture translated to not just the types of stories that you've taken on to produce, but this story in particular? I, I feel like that experience of coming into a country not knowing how to speak the language, I didn't speak English, and I remember getting thrown into like kindergarten and trying to learn English witnessing my mom was discriminated quite a, quite often but not having a conversation about that or ha you know having a conversation about racism and prejudice because she didn't know what was happening we were working with social workers trying to help us find an apartment to live in and and it was actually my father's goal of like hopefully the kids will have a better opportunity in america so i think that when i was quite young it was shaping me to do what I am today, but not knowing the process, right? Because as we grow into our own, you go through phases. When I was really little, I was like, gosh, I wish I was not Chinese or Taiwanese. I wish I wasn't this person because everybody hates us and people don't like us. And then going through grade school, people threw rocks at our window, calling us names and making fun of us because we were immigrants. And then and then you go through a phase where when you become an adult, well, when I say adult, meaning like when you're 18 to 23, you're going, I need to learn who I am in my own skin and be accepting of it. And um, as I went through that, I finally realized that I need to be proud of my culture, my heritage, and, and also fight for that, fight for those who are oppressed in that way. So it kind of shaped the, the way that I mean, of me could becoming a producer. I'm like, oh my God, I get, I get to be an activist through storytelling. Now, I know we want, I want to talk more about passing, but I'm trying to actually get there. Uh, you and Forrest producing Fruitvale Station, which was a film that really moved me when I saw it. And um, every time I think about Fruitvale Station, because I haven't gone back to revisit it again, is I think about that painful kind of third act scene where, you know, Octavia Spencer is looking at him and on that slab. Um, it looks like, and, and I think from looking through your filmography of the films that you guys have worked on, there's a certain thread of humanity that kind of goes into that. Is that a part of the process of the sorts of, of films you guys try to take on? Yes, absolutely. Humanity, but also we want to create empathy and compassion for audience members. Because I remember when we came out with Fruitville Station, you know, some people were like, this, is, this film is for the Black community. I'm like, no, 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 not only the Black community, this film is for everyone. I want the white community to see it. I want the Asian community to see it because they need to see the process of, of what happened with Oscar Grant and, and the the systemic racism that comes from that and people are like what because they just they thought that we made a film only for the black community so that's it's about creating humanity and people can can create empathy or feel like wow they're humans so so that really led to pretty much everything we do but also with a with the fact that we want to make sure that it's from the right lens now, as it relates to your latest film, Passing, um, and I wish Rebecca Hall were here because I really want to ask her this question, but you will suffice, Nina. <laughs> that, uh, I think that the fact that you guys put it in black and white also speaks to the time period of when the film takes place, which is in the 1920s. 
But I think it's also brilliant that in having it in black and white, you have both Ruth Nega and Tessa Thompson who uh, who actually look the part and it and you kind of get inside of that black and white. I think there's a feeling of it, it being I, I don't want to use the word it's ne- it's not negative, but it's sort of overcast throughout the entire film as you're looking at these sets and kind of it, it's very muted. Was that an intentional choice on you guys' part in order to kind of make that a part of the mood of the story? Well, it was always Rebecca's choice from the beginning to shoot it in black and white, even though she was discouraged by so many people like, don't do it because maybe the film will be less valuable. But then she said to me, I need to film this in black and white because it's about the gray areas. Nothing is black and white. And, and what these two characters go through, even characters of Andre, Andre Holland, it's like they're all in certain gray areas of how they feel. Um, another important factor is not only being able to showcase the period piece of it all, but we wanted to make sure that in black and white, someone like Tessa can actually pass. If we shot this in color, it's actually a lot tougher for her to pass. So that was another really, really important reason. Well, it's funny you say that because I was literally just having this conversation with my significant other. And I said, I've met both Ruth Nega and Tessa Thompson. And in real life, if you didn't put this film in black and white, it, like to your point, it would be extremely difficult to make that case. But um, I'm very interested in your feelings of the sorts of projects. And I keep getting back to the sorts of projects that you guys take on because many of them are stories that feature people of color. Um, what, are, what, are, what are some of the goals that you guys have at your production company, not around, not just with empathy and you know wanting to tell stories that have a certain level of energy, but what are some of the stories that you would be interested in taking on, Nina? So, yes, I, not only is it empathy and all that, but we want entertainment. We want to showcase entertainment for a multicultural audience, multicultural talent. The thing is, as a production, as being who we are as a production company, we usually get the very typical projects that come through to us. Usually, black and brown trauma, Mm. um, more trauma, immigration trauma for Asian people, um, you know, anything in the BIPOC realm, trauma, trauma, trauma. And we're just like, we always push back and say there are so many incredible narratives for people of color in this industry. It doesn't always have to root in trauma. If it's rooted in trauma, it has to be from the right lens. It has to come from a place of authenticity. For example, Barry Jenkins, you know, he creates something about, he creates an entire series about the Underground Railroad, but from his perspective. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that we constantly are out there preaching and say, please, we are looking for stories that, first of all, there's so many incredible historical stories that haven't been told and and characters that haven't been featured. But if it comes from an entertainment lens, but also in the underbelly of it is something that creates people's emotions and, and empathy and compassion, but also entertainment value, we that's a winner for us. So, so that's what we're always looking for. If you look at Godfather of Harlem, people's like, oh, Bumpy Johnson's a gangster and, and it's mafia and all of that. But then you, you think of, actually, we're talking about Harlem culture, music, politics, what Adam Clayton Powell Jr. did, what Malcolm X has gone through. It, and it's full entertainment value. But then people who watch it go, gosh, I'm learning something, especially younger generation of today. So it's a combination of everything. First and foremost is to showcase talent of color through authentic lenses and entertainment. So we're almost at our end right now, Nina, but I have one more question. I asked this question to another uh, actor uh, of of color over the weekend. So I wanted to make sure I asked you as well. Um, I, we put on the Black Real Awards and we've been producing this show for over 20 years. We have honored some of the films that you guys have produced. But how have you seen, I've seen the evolution and the progress of African-American directors and other creatives over the course of the last two to three decades. Are you seeing that same level of progress with Asian American uh, projects as well? Or, or, or Or do we have still a lot of work to do? 
I do, I do see progress. I think that Asian um, storytellers and filmmakers are a little bit behind the African-American diaspora of filmmakers and storytellers. There are some of them coming up um, that I have been tracking and also even um, developing projects with because I am looking for the Asian American Ryan Coogler and the Asian American Boots Riley and, and those out there that do have a very singular vision, um, but also revolutionary vision and also encouraging them not to think within the box. They don't have to self-censor. I think being Asian American, what happens is we're always self-censoring because we're told that we can't pursue a, a, a career in storytelling. So usually Asian American filmmakers and creators come a little bit later into their life when they pursue film and entertainment because they're told they have to get their MBA or PhD and then they can pursue something because there's a fallback. Right, <laughs> so, right, 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 right. So there's a bit of a gap. And my job and my job as a producer is to encourage these creatives to say, let's do this, but don't self-censor and tell the story you want. Don't think what the business wants you to do, but tell the story you want, because I've had this awesome experience with Black filmmakers that get to do that. And it was so, it's such a blessing to support them and have people open their eyes and go, wow, that's what we can do. And that's the most important thing is have that representation for the younger generation of filmmakers and storytellers to say, I can do that too, on the, on the producing front as well. Well, Nina, I want to thank you because, as I said, I've been reading about your projects and supporting your projects, and I definitely wanted to talk to you. Very honored that you took the time out today to spend with us, so I want to thank you for that. Tim, thank you for having me, and thank you for supporting all of our projects. I know that. I know that you've been supporting. So when, when I saw that I was going to meet with you, I was super excited because, you know, it's journalists like you that gives us that amplifies the voices that we need so i am so grateful and appreciative of what you do all right well thank you and uh, i want you to hold on though thank you and uh i look forward to talking to you soon all right yeah thank you all right